Hi everyone! Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium. Uh, and with me today are two of our students that are probably familiar faces. I'm still going to let them introduce themselves. And we will start with uh, Eli, since he's to my left. Hi, uh, I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. So tonight we have a super fun show all about uh, how animals and insects too, I believe you have in there, right, Lindsay? Um, yep. How you, they use physics to kind of, in their lives, to do things. Um, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give away what's going to be coming up. Um, so if you um, have any questions throughout the show, leave them down in the comments. We will be keeping an eye on those. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and just turn it on over to Lindsay. All right, so we're going to be looking, uh, as Jessica said, at all the different ways that physics kind of shows up in the animal world. So first, we are going to look at um, how animals get their color. So first of all, we need to know what color is. And so if we have white light entering into a prism, um, the shape of this prism is a structure that separates the white light into the different colors so that we see all colors of the rainbow. So some important things to note. One is that the white light is made up of all of the colors of the rainbow. So when you combine them all, you'll get white light. Also, that the separation of colors happens because of the structure of the glass prism. So pigment is the first thing that we're going to look at. So pigment is actually uh, a substance that is found um, in plants and animals. So with pigments, you have sunlight, that's white. All of the colors of the rainbow are coming in. Uh, they hit this leaf and the pigment in the leaf absorbs all of the colors of the rainbow except for green. The pigment reflects green back to your eyes, which is why the uh, leaf ends up looking green. So with birds, their feathers have some pigment granules and then that's covered by a keratin cortex. So keratin is the same type of material that your fingernails are made out of. So we have um, white light from the sun coming in, all the different colors of the rainbow. Um, they hit the pigment granules in the bird's feather and then all of the colors get absorbed except for red the red gets reflected so that our bird looks red. Um, some other animals that are colored by pigment, uh, this ladybug, um, the black parts of the ladybug actually would absorb all light. The white parts of this polar bear reflect all of the light back to you, so they look white. Um, and of this frog, we have um, reflects yellow light, but absorbs all of the other colors. So another way that animals can get their color is from the structure of like their feathers or their skin, things like that. So again, we have this structure of the glass prism separating out the white light into all of the different colors. Um, and then this oil slick, um, it's not different colors because there are different pigments causing the color in the oil. Uh, there's actually uh, structural differences. So some parts of the oil slick are shallower um, and some parts of the oil slick are deeper. And so that difference causes um, different colors to get reflected uh, back to your eye. Uh, so uh, here's an animal that that kind of happens with. He, in this case, uh, it is called iridescence. So with this bird, um, we have a couple of layers. So we have that keratin cortex again, um, and then some 
melanin rodules, and then another keratin layer, and then another, oops, another layer of the melanin, and then another layer of the keratin. So we have the white light coming from the sun, and then when the light hits this first keratin layer, um, the green light gets reflected uh, up in this direction, blue light gets reflected in this direction, and then purple gets reflected off in this direction, and all of the other colors get absorbed. Um, and at each keratin layer, those colors, green and blue and purple, get reflected at the same angle. So when you're viewing from this angle, you are seeing the bird's feathers as green. Uh, when you're viewing as this angle, um, then you're, the bird's feathers are looking blue. And then from this angle, the bird's feathers are looking purple. So with the pigment, the objects are gonna look the same color no matter what angle you're looking at it from. But with this iridescence structure, the color of the bird's feathers changes depending on the angle that you're looking at it with. Um, here's a snake that has iridescence on its some of its scales. So um, again, this iridescence is not from pigments in the skin, just because of how scales are structured, um, the snake looks iridescent. Another way that you can get color from structure um, is with blue color and it's non-iridescent. So one thing about blue color that I think is kind of cool, finding blue pigments naturally occurring in nature uh, is very, very rare. So most of the time when you see blue color out in the animal world, it is blue because of the structure of like its feathers or fur or skin. So in this case, we have that first keratin layer again, and then we have a spongy layer of keratin and air, and then a melanin layer at the bottom. So we have the white light coming from the sun going into this keratin air layer, and all of the other colors are getting absorbed, but blue is getting reflected, not because there are blue pigments in this keratin air layer, but because of the structure of the keratin air layer. And so no matter what angle you look at this bird from, it's gonna look blue. So these are two more examples of animals that get their blue color due to the structure of their um, wings or feathers. So we have the blue in this butterfly um, being caused by the structure in the wings and then the blue of the feathers of this bird being caused by the structure of the feathers. Uh, another cool thing about pigments is that with your eye color. So if you have green eyes or brown eyes, um, that means you have green pigments or brown pigments in your eyes. But if you have blue eyes, uh, like I do, I don't have any blue pigments in my eyes, actually. Blue-eyed people, um, they look blue-eyed just because of the structure of their irises um, interacts with the light going into their eye and makes their eye look blue. Pretty cool, I think. So another way that animals can get color um, is by so there's having some material that interacts with a high energy light wave like ultraviolet light. So we already have talked about how the sun emits all of the colors of the rainbow and white light, but it also emits a lot of different other um, light waves. And so in this case, we're gonna be looking at ultraviolet light. Um, it's just like the black light that you might see. And then the material absorbs that ultraviolet light and then emits a different color, invisible light specifically. So before we had visible light coming in, getting reflected um, as visible light again. So visible light stayed visible light, but in this case we have ultraviolet light coming in and then visible light coming out. So this is called fluorescence. So one animal that fluoresces is coral. And we're not really sure why coral fluoresces. 
uh, one idea is that um, it may be a sunscreen type material for the coral. So, you know, when you are looking for sunscreen as a human and you want it to, uh, you know, block out most of the sun's rays, you're looking for, you know, UV blocking sunscreen, that ultraviolet light sunscreen. And so coral probably needs sunscreen too. And so the material that is fluorescing on these corals could be sunscreen protecting the coral from those damaging UV rays. Uh, another animal that fluoresces uh, is a scorpion. And actually, if you live in areas where there are scorpions, um, the way that you look for them in your backyard is you get a black light flashlight and then you try to look for uh, scorpions fluorescing. We're not really sure, again, why the scorpion is fluorescing. Um, it could be like a sunscreen type material, like with the coral. Um, it could be a way to find a mate. Um, also, scorpions have really poor eyesight. So another idea is that um, this material that is fluorescing um, kind of allows the scorpion to sense how much of it is in shadow and how much of it is in sunlight. So right now we have it all fluorescing, which means that it's completely in sunlight. If it were half fluorescing, then it would be in half in shadow and half in, uh, in the sunlight. So it knows if it is hiding well enough or not, um, because once it's all in shadow, this material is gonna stop fluorescing. So it will be able to sense that that has happened and that it is, is well hidden. Okay, then we have bioluminescence. So this happens with a lot of um, animals in the deep ocean. It's something like over 80% of animals over like 600 meters below the surface of the ocean have bioluminescence. So um, with the fluorescence, there was light coming in and then getting absorbed and then visible light getting um, reflected back out. In this case, light happens because there's a chemical reaction that happens um, in the cells. And so this chemical uh, is called luciferin. And it actually can cause different colors sometimes. And there are several different reasons why uh, organisms bioluminesce. So they can use their bioluminescence to startle another animal, uh, misguide another animal, or distract another animal, maybe um, warn that animal that you're there. It can also be used offensively to lure prey, like in the movie Finding Nemo. And it could be used to sun or confuse prey or just to illuminate prey. You know, that far deep down in the ocean, of course, you don't have sunlight anymore. It doesn't get down that far. So you need a different way to make light. Um, and other bioluminescent organisms use it for mate attraction. Okay, next we're gonna talk about magnetoreception. So first we're gonna watch this video about how turtles probably use Earth's magnetic field and magnetoreception to help them navigate. Imagine waking up on the beach before dawn. The glimmer of light leads you to the shoreline. Suddenly a wave pulls you in. At first, you use the direction of the waves to guide you. But once you're in the open sea, with powerful currents bombarding you, and very little light, how can you be sure of where you are and where you're going? For a hatchling sea turtle, the answer is magnetoreception. That's the ability to sense magnetic fields. We don't know many animals use this sixth sense for navigation. What we don't know is exactly how magnetoreception works. Here's what we do know. Earth itself is like a giant magnet. The motion from its liquid outer core generates a magnetic field. 
Certain animals can sense this field and use it as a compass to tell them if they're heading in the right direction and a map to give them signposts along the way. There's two competing theories for how magnetoreception works. One is a chemical sensor, the other is, is a mechanical sensor. The first theory is that animals have tiny magnetite particles in their bodies that act as magnetic receptors. Magnetite is the most magnetic natural metal on Earth. It's been found in many animals that exhibit magnetoreception. And it's thought that it's the only potential sensor that would be sensitive enough to capture these incredibly tiny variations in magnetic field strength that would allow the animal to, to not just know whether they're going north or south along the magnetic field line, but know the precise beach that they need to get to. The other theory is that animals possess a protein in their eyes called cryptochrome, which allows them to see magnetic fields. Cryptochrome has been found in the eyes of several migratory birds, but we haven't proven either theory for a few reasons. With magnetoreception, you don't know where to look. Magnetic fields pass invisibly through the entire body, so researchers don't know exactly where these magnetite particles or cryptochromes would be attached to particular cells, and so mistakes are made all the time. And so far, cryptochrome experiments have only yielded positive results in the presence of magnetic fields much stronger than Earth's. The frontier is now so n not so much at the animal behavior level, but actually getting inside the brains of these animals and trying to find uh, these sensing cells and connecting them to the neural circuitry. It's not so much a question of, of which animals have this sense, but which don't. So researchers have said, well, why not humans? Maybe we had this sense at one point deep in our evolutionary past and, and lost it but maybe there's a vestige left. Researchers in California and, and Japan have gone after this, this holy grail one more time. A very specialized experiment, one that relies on double blinding and uh, magnetic shielding. And they're seeing glimmers, maybe even more than glimmers, of this magnetic sense in humans. It's starting to be reproducible and they're really excited about it. So some other animals that can, uh, that use magnetoreception, um, the Zambian mole rat, um, the honeybee, um, and the homing pigeon. Another animal that uses magnetoreception is the fox. It uses magnetoreception uh, and also the physics of projectile motion to help it hunt. Winter in the Yellowstone National Park. The snow here is regularly more than two meters deep. A red fox can survive here all winter, but only if it can find enough food. Their ability to pinpoint rodents beneath the thick layer of snow has always been attributed to their exceptional hearing. And that is part of the process. Foxes can move each ear independently, rotating them up to 150 degrees. More than a dozen separate muscles finely tune the position of the ear canal so the fox can identify a sound and locate it more accurately. But in 2010, scientists uncovered something astonishing. It's long been known that to reach the prey beneath the snow, or even in thick grass, foxes use a technique called a mouse pounce. What this recent survey found was that the overall hit rate was just 18%. But when the fox faced in a northeasterly direction, the hit rate rose to a staggering 73%. Unbelievably, the foxes seem to be aligning their pounces to the Earth's magnetic field, which tilts downward in the Northern Hemisphere. It's thought 
that the fox can detect this magnetism. As the fox creeps forward, it listens for the sound of a mouse, searching for that sweet spot where the angle of the sound hitting its ears matches the slope of the Earth's magnetic field. When it finds that spot, the fox knows that the prey is a fixed distance away and it can calculate exactly how far to jump to land right on top of it. Scientists think that the secret behind this talent might be a protein in the fox's eye called cryptochrome, which is sensitive to the Earth's natural magnetism. What's more, they speculate that this might actually allow them to see the magnetic field as a patch in their vision. If the scientists are correct, the red fox will be the first animal known to use the Earth's magnetic field to hunt. That's one of my favorite videos, just super cute how the foxes um, sense the magnetic field and hunt for their prey. So some animals navigate, um, not by detecting the magnetic field of Earth, but by using patterns in the stars. So first we're gonna look at this wild caught Indian bunting. These are birds that um, are found in Canada mostly, and they have a lengthy uh, migration to the south every winter to avoid the cold winters in Canada. So they were trying to figure out how these birds know which way south is. And so they put some of these birds actually inside of a planetarium <laughs> and then turned on the constellations. And they found that no matter how the um, constellations were oriented in the planetarium, they always headed towards the constellations that would be in the south um, during their migration. Um, so yeah, they're using those star patterns of the constellations in the southern sky to help them find their way to the south. Dung beetles, uh, they do not want to, so this is their dung ball. <laughs> they want to roll it in a straight line so they don't end up um, exactly where they came from. And so to make sure that they're rolling it in a straight line, they actually look at the brightest part of the sky, um, often the brightest part of the Milky Way, and then they just keep their eye on that brightest spot and keep heading towards that brightest spot in the sky to make sure that they're going um, straight. Uh, there are also some animals that can walk on water. So um, water uh, has water tension. Um, and so here we have the water molecules kind of all um, attracted to each other. It comes here. So when you drop water on the leaf, it doesn't lay flat in the leaf. It uh, makes this ball of water because of the water tension. So this spider uses the water tension um, of this pond um, to actually walk on water. So its legs, um, they don't apply enough force to the water to like pierce through and um, the surface tension like we would. That's why humans can't walk on water. We're too big, we have too much force. The surface tension can't hold us, but the spider is light enough that the surface tension of the water can hold it um, above the surface of the water. Okay, and now we're gonna look at some animals and how they create sound. So crickets, um, on one side of the wing, they have um, like a serrated edge, and then they have another serrated edge on their other left 
wing. And so they rub those together really fast um, to create the chirping noises um, that the cricket makes. So what they were trying to find is how the cricket makes the chirping noises. And they noticed that uh, the cricket does not create those chirping noises vocally. So they had to find another way that the crickets were making the chirping noises. And they found out that it's these wings that are rubbing together that are making the chirping noises. And then we have this bird and the sound that it makes, it doesn't come out of, it's not vocally made either. It comes come out of the vocal cords. So this bird is actually making sound by rubbing its wings together. So one side of the wings has a serrated edge again and the other has a flat edge. And this bird can beat its wings together 107 times per second. Pretty crazy. And so that is how it's making its uh, sound um, instead of like tripping like other birds that use their vocal cords. Uh, lastly, we have some animals that use echolocation um, to locate prey. So we have um, sound waves coming from the bat, reflecting off of this dragonfly back to the bat. And the fact that there's some reflecting sound waves tells the bat that there's something over here. If there was nothing over here, then the sound waves would just keep going. They wouldn't have anything to reflect off of. So this video is gonna show you a couple of the different animals that use echolocation. Think of a cat silently stalking a bird or a rattlesnake ready to ambush a mouse without rustling a leaf on the forest floor. An owl can swoop down on a mouse without making a sound. Silence is the cloaking device predators use to capture a meal. Now consider bats, whales, dolphins, porpoises, and a few other animals that use their voices to find prey. Through echolocation, these animals emit sounds of different frequencies and loudness that bounce off the objects around them. The echoes are then captured by the ears and the brain figures out how to recognize food and navigate the surroundings from those signals. Some bats emit sound blasts that are so loud they could deafen human hearing. Only we cannot hear their ultrasonic voices. The world would sound quite different if we could. Like whales and dolphins that use echolocation in water, bats use their voices to see the world through air and very effectively. A katydid rests motionless on a leaf, one of thousands of leaves on a tree. The insect doesn't make a peep. The night is black. A leaf-nosed bat flying nearby blasts the tree with sonar at ultrasound frequency, then listens. It sees the cavey did with the echo created from sonar and swoops in for the kill. No human main sonar equipment can detect objects with such finesse. In fact, the most sophisticated submarine sonar system, large as a house, cannot see the world nearly as well as a bat. Leaf-nosed bats are at the pinnacle of echolocating animals. Their fleshy noses are like musical instruments that amplify and focus the sounds made with their larynx. In fact, their noses change shape to produce different sounds for scanning different objects in the surroundings. Their ears are also capable of shape-shifting to capture the sensory information they need at any moment so they can fly in the dark without hitting tree limbs or power lines, communicate with each other, and pick an insect meal from dense vegetation with surgical precision. All right, so that is 
the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, go ahead and type them uh, in the comments below the video. Very cool. I definitely think the, uh, the fox is, is still my favorite. They're so cute. <laughs> the bats with the leaf noses are pretty cute too. That's just crazy, like the stuff they can do. And speaking of, hi, come here. Um, my little furry physicist, Susan Nova, decided to come say hi to everyone. She heard them talking about cats and had to make an appearance because clearly she is the superior cat, or at least that's what she thinks. So um, right before that, uh, that last video, um, or maybe right after, um, we got a question, Molly Gorder asks, is it common for birds to migrate at night or is it just the birds that use constellations as navigation? navigation? That's a good question. Um, I know hawks uh, migrate during the day. Um, Hawk Ridge has um, a bunch of days where you can go up to Hawk Ridge and watch the hawk migrations. Um, so yeah, it must be I'm not 100% sure, but it makes sense that birds that use constellations to navigate would do it at night. All right. Well, um, if you do have any other questions, um, like you said, leave them now. Um, while we wait to see if anything else comes in, um, let me give you a little preview of next week because next week's going to be a little bit different uh, because it is our virtual dark sky caravan. Since we can't actually take our portable planetarium and telescopes up the North Shore like we have done the past two summers, we are moving it all online. Um, so next week, Monday through Saturday, we are going to be having a show um, here on Facebook Live every night at 7. Um, the schedule is up posted on the event. There's going to be a lot of different shows, a lot of guests that we have, um, including Bob King and Starry Skies Lake Superior. Um, and so we're going to be doing that every night at 7 next week. And then at 8.30, if the weather cooperates, we will have a live stream through one of our telescopes looking at uh, the moon and planets and whatever we can get that looks good um, on the stream. So we're very excited for that, and we hope you can join us. Um, and, yeah, it's going to be a fun-filled week. Um, yeah. Do we have anything else come in, Eli? Nope. No. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay. As always, that was amazing. Um, I love hearing about all of this. Uh, I will say foxes are my favorite. Leave in the comments what your favorite uh, animal was that you learned about. Um, I want to know what you all thought. Um, but with that, we will um, sign off for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And we hope to see you next week as we celebrate our dark skies. Um, so goodbye, everyone.